Today we're going to be discussing the structure of a caste system, how it is made permanent, and how it can make us suffer. This is the second in a series of our book study on the book Cast by Isabel Wilkerson. My name is Newsom Holmes. This is Anna Quintana. We Hello, are everyone. ministers at Unity of the Triangle in Raleigh, North Carolina. And this book study is an exploration into the caste system that has dominated American politics and social life for the last 401 years. So I hope you will join us for today and uh, stay with us for two more sessions around this. You can always refer to our last week's video in which we introduce this subject and the main ideas, but I would love to just uh, do like a quick review of um, definitions or perspectives on the caste system as brought by Isabel Wilkinson in the book. And again, a caste system is a fixed ranking of human uh, value. It says to presume sub supremacy of one group against the inferiority or presume inferiority of other groups on the basis of ancestry and traits, neutral in the abstract. We know that oh, it's whatever meaning we give to a trait, but with meaning in a hierarchy favoring the dominant caste. Stigmatizes those deemed inferior to justify the humanization necessary to keep the lowest ranked people at the bottom and to rationalize the protocols of enforcement. It is definitely about power, which groups have it and which do not, which ones are worthy of it and which ones are not, who gets to acquire the control and who does not. Race in the US is the invisible agent of the unseen force of caste. Caste is the bones and race is the skin. Race is what we see, the traits that have been given meaning and become shorthand for who a person is. Caste is the powerful infrastructure that holds each group in its place. We may mention, we may mention race, referring to people as white or black, Latino, Asian, indigenous, but what lies beneath each label is centuries of to history assigning of assigning of assumptions and values to physical features in a structure of human hierarchy. Race is the visible cue to their caste. The use of inherited physical characteristics to differentiate inner abilities and group value, most effective way to maintain the caste system surpassing all other others in intensity and subordination. So, and before I pass it on to, you, to Newsom, it's really interesting that there's some scholars that really feel very strong into knowing that using physical characteristics as a way to differentiate is the most effective, more than gender or any other of our features. So, um, how does this hold together, Newsom? Bring us light. Well, first of all, I, I just want to delve in just a little bit more to what you were saying. It, essentially, I love this phrase that she says, caste is the bones and race is the skin. And essentially what she's saying in there is that there is a, a dominance uh, that is persistent, that is based on certain characteristics. The most visible is the skin. And, but not, not the only one, but right. that is the mo most commonly used one. That is where we have placed so much emphasis on. And I think in, to some degree, we, we miss it uh, when, so a, a person like me could say, I don't see race and still enjoy the caste system. I don't see your color. I don't see color when I look at you. I, I just see a person, which is, tends to be maybe only partially true, not completely true. Um, but I don't see, uh, that's not a big deal for me. It doesn't have to be a big deal. The caste system can still be in place. 
You don't have to be a skin-oriented racist to participate in the caste system. And I think that's where the, uh, why I don't like the, wor the R word much is because it puts, it, puts the onus uh, of, of uh, not the onus, it puts the um, emphasis on, on your emotional state. You know, do you like somebody, not like somebody? Well, it's bigger than that. You know, it's really bigger than that. Uh, so how, did, how does it all stay in place is really what I'm supposed to be talking about today. But it's in place even if you didn't notice it was in place because you, you were doing your best to be a nice person, right? Yes. And yet you can still be um, part of the prop, part of the caste system that's, that's um, doing well by it. My family uh, is from northeastern North Carolina, part of it. Um, my mother had a, ma uh, a, a man who came by every day. My grandmother had a man who came by every day, to, and she loved him. She thinks she missed him more than her husband. And yet, I've never been in a town more bifurcated in, in the United States than the town she lived in. Very Which white. Which was it? Scotland Eck. Mm -hmm. And um, it's very, it's an interesting place to be, um, and yet, um, the systems in place, even though the emotions individually may be slightly different than, than what it looks like on the outside. So it, it makes it complicated. It's important to get that this caste system is dominating the experience, um, even though your personal relation, you may have individual relationships that are not like that. It's almost like we, there are moments where we snap, snap into, into the real. Right. To like, you know, we're just fellow human beings and we're connecting at a much deeper level. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it's just seeing how we can duplicate that more and more into which we really see, right? Right. So we can see the structure that we live in, the water that we swim in, essentially. Now, one of the things that um, about the caste system is it's fairly permanent. It's very permanent. If you take what's happened in India, and what's happened in the United States, and compare the two, the, um, they basically work a lot the same way. There are the Brahmins at the top and the Dalits at the bottom, and the Dalits are also known as the untouchables. Uh, they suffer in many of the same ways that African-American people in it have suffered. It was so much alike that Martin Luther King goes to India to essentially see what's happening over there and the Dalits, the untouchable, have him to a banquet and give him a, a honorary uh, prize because they say your suffering and my suffering is just the same. It's pretty interesting. Martin Luther King was almost insulted at first by it um, because he had just met with the prime minister a few days before and then to be cast down with the Dalits was, um, was like an insult. But then it dawned on him, no, really, we are of the same type. And so some of the ways that they, they have been able to get the caste system to last forever in India is the same way that we did it here in the United States. And I would like to read you a list and then slightly spend a little time on each one of the, well, maybe not on every one, but on some of these. Before the you say something, Nusum, I just want to point out something that came to mind that I believe that um, Isabel Wilkerson gets to the conclusion of, of um, what these pillars of, of the caste systems are based on not only on the Indian caste system and the American, but in, in Nazi Germany. Um, it's almost like the, the three of them. And, and I find like mind blowing to know that somehow the Nazis uh, studied that American caste system uh, to get to be inspired for ideas for their own, you know, Nazi Germany. I just that was mind blowing to me. Anyways, they want to interrupt, but I just figured that no, this would but, be. But you're you're, you're right on. Anna. <laughs> I mean, I I did skip the Nazis, uh, but you're right. That was like many a first of the things. To me. Many of the uh, 
austere ways we classify caste in our country were too severe for them. So they took milder approaches of who was in the in-group, the power group, and who was out than we have in this country. And um, so let me just go through it. I'll kind of okay. touch on that. Um, the first one is it's, it's divine will and the will of, and the natural order of things. So uh, before Europeans began to colonize and to enslave uh, Africans, uh, we didn't have a big thing about someone being a God wanted it this way. Mm -hmm. And this, this, this group of people is superior uh, by very nature to the other. It, was, it didn't need to be there until exploitation came about. So it was really exploitation that began to foment this idea that, that we need a good reason why we have the right to enslave you and you need to do our manual labor. And so m stories were stretched and concocted and the Bible was used as a way of justifying it. Uh, I, I, um, I really like the phrase uh, from Porgy and Bess, it ain't necessarily so, and I definitely think that applies here. It, just because you're liable to read it in the Bible, it ain't necessarily <laughs> so. Um, the, one of the other ways they would do it is they would not allow the two cast two different or different cast to intermarry or have interrelationship and you know there were laws on the books in the United States until 1967 yeah. against interracial marriage and uh, though they were not enforced for for all that time but they were in on the books and not struck down or until 1967 uh, so we're talking like 300 years of that no some I heard I, yeah, I think three, I remember a long time yeah, yeah. Wow, that's like big. These are, there are certain things that you go, really? Yeah. So no social mobility in a caste system. Uh -huh. You are where you are, and that's what you get. You can't go up, and you can't. So um, that also then plays very well into the uh, another one, which was purity and pollution. Essentially that the upper caste is pure, and the lower caste is polluted, and do not... They do not mix because of that. You would not shake hands with them. This is true in India as it is in was in the United States for a long time during Jim Crow. You weren't to touch uh, a person of the other caste. And, and this purity carries over uh, into the time of having swimming pools. There's a horrible story of a young uh, black boy who's playing on um, a... a Little League team with all white uh, teammates except for him, and they win the championship. And so they go to the swimming pool to celebrate, and all the white kids get to go in, but the black kid doesn't get to go in because he would defile the water. And as a matter of fact, um, at some point they impress upon the lifeguard to finally let him in. So the lifeguard puts him in a little boat and pushes him around inside the pool but he said, do not touch the water. This is, um, I mean, of course, to many of us, we would say this is ridiculous, but this is how the caste system begins to enculturate people, mm -hmm. everybody, into a certain way of thinking. It's being fully immersed in the matrix, no? So it's a, it's, a, it's, it's like, a matrix kind of thing. Mm -hmm. It's a... It's a it's the problem that we have lived in, and um, you know that uh, have you when we have, when we when we come now to let's say that the <laughs> present moment when we come to the present moment and there are police shootings, um, I think when we see this, especially let's say with George Floyd or some of the other ones that have just been caught on camera and and exposed this sense of other that 
I'm sure not all policemen have it. I, I watched the policeman here in Raleigh take a knee with everybody else when they were do, first doing the demonstrations there. But in the culture, this idea of dominance and terrorizing has been, is still in the culture. And so it bubbles up in individuals and in individual actions in ways that um, are horrifying to some of us. I would like to pursue this idea of it bubbles up. If you th think, as we say here often, that we are, have access to the divine mind, we also have access to the collective. collective unconscious. That collective bubbles up in our awareness, and sometimes it brings us some really good things, some insights on how to do stuff, or, or we know how to do something that we can't really explain, but we're really tapping into a reservoir of human thought and emotions, mm -hmm. et, et cetera, that give us access to information we might not e easily be able to explain where we got it. But it can also bubble up with some nasty stuff and some attitudes that can be quite harmful. And so once you've held a caste system in place for a long time, it begins to bubble up in people. and. Um, I think this is the real work that is ahead of us. It's a lot of work uh, for us to transform the collective consciousness. Of course, it starts with us, and we can fight against what we what bubbles up inside us. But um, it's insidious. I, I I can't help but think of of Fillmore. He says that going back to the concept of collective consciousness, that we, like any part of the programming that we have inherited that might not be the, the most in alignment with reality, reality being upper R, is that we can take ownership and make it like a resolution, a determined resolution. I'm not being, I'm not playing this anymore. Right. But you need to be aware. You that... need to be aware. Right. And essentially, this is what we're doing, Newsom. Right? It's exactly right. Mm -hmm. And when you have this caste system in place, and you have easy markers of demarking who is in uh -huh. the caste and who is that out, this becomes easily uh, replicatable over wherever you go in the country, you don't even have to have, you can have the same last names as somebody in different caste. You can have everything, the same education. You can have all these things, but we can see by characteristics that are on your skin and in your face, you're one of us or you're not. And that is part of the way it persists, is that we identify. And that is where the race comes in. We identify a race, which most scientists would say race is an artificial designation, but we have made it. We have figured out how to use it. And our problem now is uh, not how to not have the race, but to how to deconstruct the caste that we have put people in and to change the roles that people can play, allow for, essentially allow for uh, social mobility and for um, the ability to be a human being without degradation, that is what we're up to. And it's almost like eliminating the, the term a stereotype from our, our awareness. Think about it. Yeah. Stereotypes, it's, it's probably like the, like the expressions of, of the matrix of the program that we just categorize, you know, if, right. if, um, if I'm from Puerto Rico, um, you know, I should look this way or... <laughs> yeah, Anna, I think it's pretty interesting. I mean, we have half our staff almost is now yeah. from Puerto Rico. And... Uh, I, and he's becoming Puerto Rican. I, I'm going to have to learn to speak Spanish, and I'm, I'm eating enough rice and beans now that I may become honorary Puerto Rican. But um, I think it's pretty interesting. Y'all have 
have brought a great deal of life to us, of course. Um, do you find discrimination here in uh, your experience by being Puerto Rican? I must say, and I might be an exception, but it's I have not been, I have not really felt discriminated against. Um, however, I must say that um, that still I would feel how, because of the stereotypes, they just make, or others might make immediate assumptions about what my life should be like or, or, or maybe what my background has been or whatever. But I realize that I do it with other groups too. Yeah. And Anna, you have such a strong personality. Um, and you know, you might pass in this country. <laughs> so. uh, <clears throat> I don't know if we have enough time to do this, but... <clears throat> I think we got like five minutes. Briefly, one of the things that every immigrant group wanted to do was to be able to arrive in the dominant, group. dominant class. And there was a... a a case of a Japanese American, Japanese, who was in America, who wanted to be classified as white in America so that he would have the privileges. Yes. And the Supreme Court said, no, even though your skin is white, even though you're whiter than most white people skin wise, you have some other characteristics and therefore you will be called Asiatic and cannot be considered a citizen. And so you too can't be in the upper caste. Incredible. So it's not just skin. We have, uh, it is everybody wants to get in. They do, many of the Europeans did eventually, uh, mm -hmm. but it was actually a hierarchy in there that the Anglo-Saxons were on top and then the others had to work their way into it. So finally the Irish and the Italians and Poles, they got in, they made it across the barrier I think in large part because you, it was hard to distinguish them. But um, this is a, this is a, uh, this is why people who say, you know, we were persecuted, yeah, but you were persecuted for a generation, not for generations. Exactly. Um, as I'm hearing that, Nusam, I'm, I'm also thinking of in, in my own Hispanic um, tradition or heritage of having friends who, would not be, you know, willing to learn about their background, you know, like friends that I had, were in college with me because they wanted to make sure they would blend in with mainstream. And, and to me, that was like really shocking because I've always felt very proud of my heritage. It's like, you can be uh, in the American system and still be honorable as a Latino woman. But I realized that maybe I was not deep enough into the matrix. Anyways, I would love to <laughs> to um, just maybe have some closing statements um, because it's almost like as we let the pain or the darkness um, into our space, uh, witnessing what has really happened and what is holding all this caste system together, it's going back to principle and just um, surrendering everything to to spirit and to God. So if I may, may I just um, do a closing prayer with, this is from Marianne Williamson. So everybody join us at this moment. It says, Dear God, we join in prayer to celebrate this nation and surrender its destiny to you. We give thanks in our hearts for the founding of this country. We may, we may, may we play our parts in the healing and the furtherance of our country. May be we cleanse of all destructive thoughts. May judgment of others, bigotry, racism, and tolerance be washed clean from our hearts. May God's unconditional love and acceptance allow us to accept everybody. May our lives be tur turned into instruments of resurrection that the sins of our fathers might be reversed through us. May the beauty and the greatness of this land for burst forth once more in the hearts of its people. May the dreams of our forefathers be realized in us, that we may live in honesty and integrity and excellence with our neighbors. May this country once again become a light unto the nations of hope and goodness, peace and freedom. 
May violence and darkness be cast out of our midst. May hatred no longer find fertile ground in which to grow here. I would love to remind everybody that this Sunday, November 1st, we're coming together in person here, right, Newsom at the church at 5 o'clock, to hold that as pre-election uh, day, uh, pre-election, uh, to just hold the unity, the love, and all new possibilities for our country and the world. So we'll see you next week. If hope in between, you get a chance to read the book and follow some discussions somewhere. And may this be a time of awakening for you and for our country to a place where we accept all people as equals and children of God. And we cast aside the caste system. We can be ourselves. And this is our time to do it. Thank you for sharing this time with us and hope you can subscribe to our channel and see you soon. Mm -hmm.